Nell'episodio di oggi della Snack Covenant, in the same way that Gwendolyn is like the perfect sort of ruler for this time, Aldrich is sort of the perfect villain for that time. Neither of them are tied down to like fire or dark or set forms or set anything. It's like those two things end up in conflict. And that to me is a way more interesting story than what if a cool guy with wings and two swords was at war with two princes but they never actually shared any screen time together. Non vi dimenticate di alzare il dito medio all'algoritmo cliccando sulla campanellina per le notifiche. Speriamo che questo episodio sia di vostro gradimento. Hi Sophie. Hi Sam. Hi everyone. And welcome to the Snack Covenant episode F10. <laughs> And today we're going to talk about Aldrich. And Gwendolyn. Yes, this is a mukbang video. So, Sophie. Yes, Sin. We both rewatched The Bastard's Curse. I rewatched it through a little gap in my fingers. And today it's going to be a bit of a Bastard's Curse 2 type situation. Okay, well, Sin, you're talking about the Bastard's Curse like people actually know what it is. About seven years ago, it was late 2016, I made a Dark Souls 3 lore video that was me kind of attempting to get all these things from Dark Souls 3 that, like, initially seemed a little bit random and disconnected, like, what is the difference between the dark and the deep? What's the deal with, like, the evangelist? I made that, and it was called The Bastard's Curse. It was on my old channel, and I had at that time about 8,000 subscribers. And then uh, one day in early 2017, I woke up and I had 20,000 subscribers. And I thought that's very odd. Has there been a mistake? No, it turned out that when the Ring City came out, uh, Vardy in his initial Ring City video had linked the Bastard's Curse. And uh, yeah, consequently, it got a lot of traffic. I think it ended up with about 350,000 views um, in the end. The thing about it, like rewatching it, it doesn't seem remotely... Uh, interesting in 2024. I'm not saying I was the first person to do this because I clearly wasn't. But like, I think because of the attention it got through Vardy, who was like a very mainstream creator, it was the first time that like a lot of people had seen a Souls video that approached it using stuff like, hey, the game is from Japan. Maybe we should talk about how Shinto works. Talking about translations from Japanese to English and talking about stuff that was cut from the game and everything like that, which is like, that's everyone's bread and butter now. Lots of people do that. But like, like I was saying, um, people were always doing that. But because of the attention that it got, I think it was a lot of, if you go directly from Vardy to that, it seems a lot more drastic. So that channel doesn't exist anymore because I got sick of people saying that was the good one and what we're doing here is bad. And I think uh, my feelings about that could be their own episode, but I don't want to drag it on. It was a video that talked about Aldrich a lot and the deep and um we sort of wanted to redo it now that like we're a little older and a little wiser and we kind of know what we're doing hey how you doing it's uh from software president hitotaka miyazaki here and i've just received a note from uh, sin who says that she is very busy and can't edit the podcast to her usual standards Do I have any advice for her as someone whose entire career is based on clearly unfinished projects? All right, uh, solution number one, you insert scenes you cut out of all the podcasts into this one and claim the whole episode is happening in a dream. Solution two, get Yui to do it. Suggestion number three, get a clip from earlier in the podcast that repeat it three or four times but add different audio post-processing and try to pass it off as different guests. Solution number four, when in doubt, add more dragons. And my personal favorite, solution number five, include a reference to the fact the episode isn't working very well and people will think it's meta. Anyway, I hope that was helpful. Uh, if not, fuck you. I have to go now and make sure that Shadow of the Art Tree has enough delightful turtle puzzles. 
So Aldrich. Yes. In the intro, he is sludge. In the boss fight, he's a beautiful young lady. Be careful who you make fun of in high school. TLDR quickly, because we've been through this 27 million thousand times. We have 7 billion episodes on our channel on Bloodborne, Dark Souls, Demon Souls, and all this stuff. You're really selling this episode, aren't you? (laughs) It's the same shit we always do. (laughs) Like, just quickly, what the F is an Aldrich? Aldrich is one of the Lords of Cinder, which means he's someone who in the past had linked to the fire. He sacrifices himself to keep the flame going. He's one of five in Dark Souls 3. And Aldridge's story is that he was a cleric. He was a cleric of the Way of White, and they specify, oh, he was, he was a right and proper cleric. At some point, he developed a taste for human flesh. And the taste for flesh seems to have sort of gone hand in hand with him becoming quite sadistic because it talks about like he wouldn't just eat people. He would actually like save a sort of the screaming and he would save a like the death throes of that person. Um, you were streaming Dark Souls 3 earlier and you compared him to Smo. Smo is also a cannibal, but like he was an executioner. And then after people had died, it said he would grind up their bones and use their bones in his food. So he was just a foodie. Essentially, yeah. But Aldridge, like, is actually straight up, like, eating people while they are still alive. Yeah. And it talks about him, like, he would share these feasts with other people. So all these people would get around and just, just uh, chow down on a dude. So this was the guy who uh, was venerated for linking the fire. The more that he ate people, the more his body bloated. And then it bloated and bloated and bloated, and after a while it just lost all shape and it just became like a pile of slime. So they got the Aldrich pile of slime, not sure how, it's like in a dump truck or something, (laughs) and they, I assume, poured it into his huge coffin in the Cathedral of the Deep. So in the intro of Dark Souls 3, you do see the Aldrich blob very briefly. I'm of the opinion that... um, that probably was never supposed to be Aldrich. I think it's kind of clear, like, now that, you know, it's not 2017 anymore, we have been digging through Dark Souls 3's data for God knows how long. Um, the Aldrich character was, and this is common to all the Souls games, like, I'm not criticizing it. The Aldrich character was something that they came up with after the fact and sort of hacked him together from existing assets they had lying around. The the goo you see in the opening, I'm pretty sure that was just uh, supposed to be like the pus of man slime coming out of a grave. And it's like, oh, it's Aldrich now. And then uh, way, way later on in the game, you finally meet Aldrich in person. And uh, you mention Aldrich is a beautiful young lady now. And that is because Aldrich has eaten Gwendolyn, kind of. It's kind of not clear. It's like, did Aldrich eat Gwendolyn and therefore become Gwendolyn? Or is that literally just Gwendolyn's corpse and there is an Aldrich goo inside, like, using it like a puppet? Also, again, if we're talking about, like, Aldrich sort of hacked together up its paces, um, the, the Gwendolyn half of Aldrich is actually Prince Lothric. <laughs> so, when Aldrich linked the fire, mm-hmm. how happy was he to do it? Well, he only really wanted to do it once. Okay. This is a recurring issue. This is the the strange plot of Dark Souls 3 is that all these people burned themselves up to link the fire. Yeah. And then they had to link the fire again. So they brought them all back to life and said, do you want to link it again? And they all said no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So the thing about Aldrich that sort of becomes his motivation is that it says he ruminates on the fading of the fire. So it's not clear when that happened. I think what it's likely supposed to mean is that Aldrich linked the flame and then came back again. And it becomes a bit like, well, what's the point? Like, I already did this. It didn't solve Mm -hmm. anything. The flame is still fading away. So what's the point in linking it again? As Aldrich was ruminating on the flame fading, he saw in his mind like this vision appearing of a great deep sea he foresaw something called the age of the deep coming and he believed that in order to reach the age of the deep he had to eat the gods it's not exactly clear how those two things uh work exactly like i'm not saying that i'm not making fun of it i'm saying that like 
you can sort of, if you squint, kind of make sense of how that works, but it's not really explained. But yeah, Aldridge is basically, um, upon being brought back from the dead as a pile of slime, um, who wouldn't burn very well, he'd be very moist. Unless he's oil. Yeah, okay. So upon being brought back from the dead, Aldrich basically decides uh, that he'd be really cool if he ate Gwendolyn. <laughs> he wants to eat the gods, and then Pontus Sullivan provides for him a means to eat Gwendolyn, who confusingly is sometimes the last god, but then they just keep adding new Gwyn children in. <laughs> Good job. And yeah, basically the way that it works is like Aldrich and Sullivan begin working together. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a like they're plotting together relationship because at this point Aldrich is largely just driven by a need to eat things. He's essentially just this massive like amoeba that's absorbing everything. But at the same time, like there are references to Aldrich's like thoughts and feelings as he is consuming things. So like he's not literally just driven by the need to eat like an animal. Like there's still some sort of human reason and consciousness in there. He may actually have like ascended to another plane of consciousness for all we know. Functionally, he's just a big blob that's eating things. And Pontus Sullivan kind of exploits Aldridge's desire to devour the gods as part of Pontiff Sullivan's plan. But you know, Aldridge does have a point, because none of the Lords of Cinder want to link the flame again. Except for, like, I think Ludlith, who just hangs out at the shrine because he's, like, bored or something. Aldridge is the only one that's like, well, why don't we try something new and different? To an extent, like, Dark Souls 3 is sort of about characters coming to terms with the fact that the fire dark binary can't persist forever kind of interesting when you put it in sequence with two this series kind of makes more sense if you imagine it goes one three two like thematically because yeah. the whole thing of three is like the characters it's 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 um lord ran again it's like the same place to come back it's like it's an orlando filing shrine what's happening is it's the people in that world coming to terms with like this can't keep going there has to be another way out of it. And like all these characters in it keep coming up with these, you know, alternate ways of approaching it. So you have like uh, Aldrich, obviously he imagines the world becoming a vast sea, but then you also have like, there's people who are turning into trees and it's kind of reverting back to being like the pre fire age where everything is gray. Mm -hmm. Um, you have like Pontiff Sullivan with the profane flame. So he's got this flame that will never go out. So he can kind of continue things. Um, all these things are happening. And then you have Dark Souls 2, where it's like, that is sort of taken for granted. Like, that's Aldia's whole thing is like, there is fire and there is dark, but then there is something else entirely. And if you want to look for that, that's up to you. Thematically, the sequence kind of goes one, three, two. It's like two is like completely different kingdom. It's God knows how many generations later. No Anne or Londo, none of this stuff. And everyone is just sitting there thinking, what the hell are we going to do now? Mm -hmm. And that becomes sort of the driving question of that game is like, what will come next? But weirdly, if you go one, two, three, what came next is Dark Souls 3. It's functionally the same plot as Dark Souls 1, except everyone's like, I don't know how this is supposed to end. That's why yeah. I just love Dark Souls 2 so much. Because like yeah. we talked yeah. about this in the past, like it helped me deal with certain things about like, you know, yeah. facing things and moving on and yeah. um, going past things. Yeah, yeah. It would have been like a beautiful conclusion to the trilogy, I think. That ending where it's just like you walking off and Aldir being like, what happens next? Like that's kind of kind of the ending that I wanted. Now, Sophie. Yes, sir. We talked about people's wants, needs, and motivations. I mean, we talked about a blob. <laughs> a concept that keeps reappearing in the whole Aldrich intrigue is the deep. The deep. The deep. Most people will assume it's a character from the boys. No? Okay. There's a character called the deep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You don't watch the boys, right? Okay. No, yeah. No. Okay. I mean, I've heard sure but... it outrighted the bastard's curse, so I think <laughs> it's probably a better reference. <laughs> the deep. The deep. Is it a place? Okay, so... Yes or no, Sophie? This is a yes or no question, ma'am. I've been watching a lot of court shows, Sophie. Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is a yes or no question. Okay. Is the deep a place? Yes. Is the deep a body of water? It's got a body of water in it. 
the thing about the deep is exactly what it is and how far it extends is a little bit vague, but we do see something that I'd say is like inarguably part of the deep. So the whole thing about the Cathedral of the Deep, the Souls games are obsessed with the aesthetics of Western religion, uh, specifically they really like Catholicism. Mm -hmm. But the way that the religions work in the universe of Dark Souls is not the way that we as, like, Western people would necessarily think of, like, religions working. Mm -hmm. I remember this was a big deal when Dark Souls first came out because people would talk about, well, if Gwyn is a god, that means the following blah, 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 blah. If this person's a god, that means this. Mm -hmm. And because they were treating, like, Gwyn as, like, oh, Gwyn is, like, Zeus. Or, like, Gwyn is, like, the Abrahamic god. Um, therefore, they follow the rules of this, and they don't. Um, Gwen is Gwen is just a very, very strong dude, and you can literally just go and kill him. When we think of a god, that's not what we think of. The same is true of the way that it's throwing around words like cathedral and saint and things like that. Like, it's using those as like rough approximations to mean like holy place and holy person. It doesn't literally mean either of those things. So again, you had people being like, well, if Saint Urbane in Demon Souls is a saint, he must have done this, and he must have done that, and he must have done that. And it's like, no, no, they're calling him Saint Urbane because he's a holy man called Urbane. And sometimes when they use the word vicar, hmm. they mean a horrible and ethical scientist. Exactly. And like, we're, again, we're fine talking about this now, but like, I think at the time it wasn't really talked about that way. Anyway, the point is, the Cathedral of the Deep, despite the fact it looks like a big, ornate, medieval Christian cathedral, it doesn't really behave like one. What it behaves like is a Shinto temple. I'm massively oversimplifying here. There's, like, so many videos on Shinto you could watch. I'm sure Last Protagonist also has a lot of stuff you can watch yeah, on this yeah. subject. But basically, in Shinto, you have these things that are just called kami which like roughly translates to God, but doesn't actually mean God. It can also, it also means something kind of like spirits or like divine thing. And they're just in the world and certain places or things or objects or people, either they are Kami or they are a dwelling place of the Kami. So the purpose of the temples is that like, there is a holy place nearby. There's like, you know, there's a holy mountain or a holy river or a holy tree or a holy artifact and you set up a temple there and then there's priests in the temple whose job it is to make sure that like the kami that's associated with that area are treated respectfully essentially the cathedral of the deep it is a temple that has been set up to worship slash consecrate slash protect the deep so the Deep, at least as far as the Cathedral of the Deep itself is concerned, is this very, very deep hole full of water that you can see from a specific balcony inside the Cathedral of the Deep. We kind of know that's the Deep because it specifies that like people would look at the Deep and the Deep would obsess them and it would drive them mad and it would kind of possess them. And there is this balcony in the Cathedral. All it does is it just looks at this big hole in the ground that's got some water in it. And on the balcony, there is one of the evangelists who are like there to kind of spread the word of the cathedral. And she is completely enraptured by this thing. She's just standing and staring. She's not patrolling like the other one. She's not actually doing anything. She's, it's almost like she's hypnotized by this thing she's looking at. And she is near a deep gem so it's sort of sending you the message like, okay, this is the deep. That thing over the balcony, that's the deep. That's what the deep physically is. Now, the Ringed City complicated this slightly by having these things called the Merkmen and saying that the Merkmen rise out of the deep. But the Merkmen are all over the Ringed City, which mm -hmm. implies the deep is under the Ringed City. So it's like, question mark, it's not quite clear what happened to the deep. The deep might have moved. 
Um, the deep might actually just be like a like a, a, a geological layer under the ground at this point, because the ring city is implied to be like way, 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 way in the future. It's not clear. Anyway, we'll just leave that aside. Thank you for watching so far. Please don't forget to stretch, snack, and hydrate. The point is, the Cathedral of the Deep, it's a place where people go to look at this really cool hole in the ground. <laughs> a hole filled with water. A hole filled with water, yeah. And that cathedral was way, way, way prior to the events of the game. It was controlled by the Way of White, mm -hmm. who are the dominant kind of religious faction in Dark Souls. And again, like something about Way of White and the way that like, the Dark Souls games, again, they're treating religion very differently to, like, what you would assume necessarily if you heard, like, the way of white and their god. So, in Dark Souls 1, the way of white are based in Thoroughland, and they worship a god called All Father Lloyd. But then by Dark Souls 3, way of white is still around, but they're based in Kareem. So, Kareem is somewhere that we've heard about in Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2. And in both those games, Kareem is the place that Velka worshippers come from. So again, the game never explicitly says this in writing, but it's like clearly the implication that when Way of White moved from Thoroughland to Kareem, they adopted Velka as their main deity and they stopped caring about All Father Lloyd. So when you're in the Cathedral of the Deep, you see there's all these statues of this, uh, like, robed, sort of weeping woman. And they're very similar, again, to a statue of Valka that you find underneath the Undead Settlement. So it's kind of saying, like, hey, all these statues in here, those are Valka, because that's who Way of White's following out because they've moved to Kareem. When Gale first shows up, he is praying to one of those statues, and he is outright calling her the Mother of the Forlorn which is, like, this thing that's associated with, like, the Velka Crow people and all this other stuff. So, like, very, very obviously, Cathedral of the Deep, when it was set up, like, they really liked Velka. And that cathedral was overseen by... It was overseen by the Deacons of the Deep. Mm -hmm. There was, like, a, a large group of them, and then they had three archdeacons who were, like, leading the three of them. Mm -hmm. um, Aldrich was also in charge. He was called the Saint of the Deep. And then there's also Rosaria, who is a lady with a big slug. And if you go to her, she will rebirth you, which means you can reallocate your stats or change your appearance. She is also there. She is, from what you read and what you see, she is also kind of like a fixture of the place. So there's all these things in there. There's like the Deacons, there's Aldrich, there's the Velka stuff, and there's Rosaria. And that seems to roughly be how things kind of chugged along for quite some time prior to everything going to shit. It seems like it was a pretty, I guess, regular organization where they had their setup, they had their Deacons, their Priestess, and they had a purpose to sort of worship the deep. And you yeah. could come at the temple to worship the deep as well. The other thing that people seem to come to the temple for is that they came there to be cleansed. Like it's an IRL thing, the purification rituals. We did a whole episode on Kagare with Last Protagonist, but the essentially the 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 way that like impurity works in Shinto is that if you are physically impure it's not just physical, it's also kind of on the soul. So if, you, if you're dirty and filthy and you have all these substances on you, like if you've got like dried blood and like bits of excrement and bits of dirt on you and you come into a sacred place, you're kind of befouling it. If we're trying, like if you're thinking about it in terms of like what's the closest like approximation in like Western stuff, 
it would be like the idea of like things being kosher or, you know, like prohibitions against certain kinds of food, like things being halal or haram, things like that. It's like, there is this sort of rule about like, you can't, the substances are bad. So the Cathedral of the Deep, like it's very focused on pure streams of water. And you can see how that kind of factors into it. But the recurring design motif you see in the cathedral, aside from the Velka statues, is these statues of people who are hunched over and something is growing out of their back. And again, we talked about this in previous podcasts, as well as the one with the last protagonist, which we should link below, which would be a good like pre-intro to this podcast. Those statues seem to maybe show that if you do have impurities, you can come Mm. here and get cleansed. And that seems to be tied to Rosaria. So again, we're saying Rosaria, like everybody knows who she is, but everybody probably does. Well, I'd kind of forgotten about her, to be honest. Oh, really? Yeah. I will never forget her because when I first met her, I had such a reaction to her when you just walk in there to this like messed up room with this woman who's been through things and it's like, what happened here? You poor thing. Oh my God. Yeah, she's like ingrained in my brain. It seems like before everything went badly, people who were suffering from this this strange affliction where things would grow on their backs would come to the cathedral and then be rebirthed through Rosaria. And that would kind of cleanse them. It's like you're starting afresh. But... The two problems with that are that if you get rebirthed too many times, you turn into a worm. I think the technical term is a grub. Well, I think the technical term is man grub. I think you're right. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, man grub. Yeah. So (laughs) when you, like, encounter man grubs, quite a lot of them are clerics. Like, they'll drop, like, cleric items, and some of them they'll be resting on these, like, cleric staffs shooting little holy bolts at you and things like that. So, like... Over time, like, the clerics of this place, through repeated rebirth through Rosaria, they became these grubs, right? The other problem is that when the Cathedral of the Deep went to shit, literally and metaphorically, (laughs) Mm -hmm. they locked Rosaria up and they killed her, her grub followers. But they kept the cleansing going. It's just that now, instead of cleansing you through being rebirthed, they cleanse you through either whipping you to get all your afflicted blood out Mm -hmm. uh, which is where the 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 first bonfire is called the cleansing chapel and you find this like whip this notched whip in the corner which is actually a whip that the evangelists carry but don't use and specifies that like yeah people would stand in the cathedral uh in the cleansing room and they just whip themselves to get all this blood out and like whipping yourself and flagellating yourself as a religious ritual is like it's not new um, there's a history of this, but the key thing about it in the Cathedral of the Deep is, like, it's tied to bloodletting. Like, they're literally trying to get blood out of you. They're not just doing it to hurt you. They're doing it so that you bleed, because there's this stuff in you they're trying to get out. The other thing that they do is they burn you. Yeah, so the, the evangelists will grab you, they will embrace you, and you will start to burn. It actually specifies that the evangelists would make these little pellets for you to take before they burned you so that it didn't hurt as much. And you see, like, people gathered around the evangelists kind of praying to them. This is all, like, something they're doing willingly. Hi, Sophie here. I can't tell you much about this episode because it's still being edited, but I can tell you one thing. The word reborn was said multiple times, which means Sin has almost certainly included a number of very funny references to her favorite anime, Katekyo Hitman Reborn. What is Katekyo Hitman Reborn? Well, (laughs) it's the story of a teenage boy who discovers he has special powers because his dad is super important but also mysterious. He teams up with a group of his friends, all of whom specialize in a certain kind of weapon. They enter a tournament and have to fight against characters who also specialize in a similar kind of weapon. There's also a girl he has a crush on in his class, but humiliates himself in front of her. Does this sound familiar to you? Well, it doesn't sound familiar to Sin, because the only other anime she's fucking watched is M.D. Geist. 
If you'd like to listen to me, listen to Sin, listen to Reborn, you can do so on Patreon. Ciao, Sue, and back to the podcast. So, you know how the more you get reborn, the more you reborn. become a man grub? There's going to be so many, like, reborn inserted in this. Mm-hmm. Every time we say reborn, there's going to be a dancing person. Do you think Aldrich, whenever he would consume humans, he'd go to get cleansed by Rosaria, and that's why eventually he became a sludge? Because he did it so many times? Like, the ultimate man grub? See, I think, like, that's that's a good, like, thematic idea. The thing is, like, Aldrich and Rosaria don't seem to like each other very much. So the way this relates to Aldrich and his grub phase is <laughs> that we hear about the Deep initially. It was somewhere that was very calm and very peaceful and very pure. It was just this, like, still, like, deep, dark water. But then over time... It just says things began to, like, settle in the deep. Like, bad things accumulating there. Yeah, and you can kind of see just by looking at the cathedral how that worked. Because parts of the cathedral on the ground are very pure, and you have the pure water. And then other parts of it literally look like a sewer. So there's just piles of, like, body parts, um, just, like, unidentified brown slime. The water has gone, like, septic. And when you go through it, it, like, slows you down, and there are these, yeah. like, disgusting enemies around you. It looks like the sewers in Dark Souls 1. So that seems to be the result of what Aldrich was doing. Because mm-hmm. Aldrich is eating people. And he's sharing that with the people around him. Mm -hmm. So all of this, like, leftover, like, bits of bone and flesh and blood and everything, it's going from where Aldrich was down into the deep, and it's corrupting it. So he's, like, throwing uneaten bones over the balcony? So this, like, mass act of cannibalism and torture is happening in the Cathedral of the Deep, and it's going from there into the deep. And that changes the nature of the deep into something that is corrupt. And that's when it starts to, like, possess people, when it starts to drive people mad. And it mentions, like, oh, yeah, within the deep, these, like, strange little insects started to appear. And you see that reflected in the design of the cathedral itself. All these statues of Velka that used to be there, either they have been covered up with a red cloth, denying sort of the presence of Velka, They're, like, splitting from the way of white. The most obvious example of that is in, again, the cleansing chapel, because you can see there is an altar that depicts Valka, but Mm -hmm. in front of it, they've moved another altar that's got the Deacons of the Deep on it. So again, it's just like very, very obvious, like, we're in charge now. It's like they went through a restructuring. Yeah, it's like we have broken from Way of White, and we're now just like the Deep. I really like this part of the of the game because it's like things start okay, this cathedral is okay, and then messed up shit happens. There's some cannibalism, and it infects the deep, but it also infects you know the people, their psyche, their souls. It just escalates and becomes so bad and disgusting and wrong. And they're like, no, let's do more of that. This is good. We like this now because it's the way of white kind of destroying itself. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, you're the ones who elevated Aldrich to this position to begin with. Because Hawkwood will tell you about Aldrich. And Mm -hmm. he specifically says, like, Aldrich became a Lord of Cinder just because he was strong. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a particularly nice person. He wasn't pure. He wasn't noble. He was just incredibly powerful. And that's why they made him Lord. And... Because they did that, that's ultimately what leads to the cathedral imploding. Because they let that guy be in charge of it. If they had seen who Aldrich was and just, like, excommunicated him immediately, this wouldn't have happened. We brought up Smo, like, a little bit. And I think it's kind of interesting to compare them because Dark Souls 1 makes this point of, like, Smo used to grind up human bones into his food. And because of that, he was denied a position as a knight. Mm -hmm. Because he did that. And then it's like, come Dark Souls 3. This guy literally... Yeah. Which frankly doesn't appear to be that much later on. 
not only do you not like get punished for being a cannibal, you get rewarded for it. But it's not even comparable. Smog was a little bit cannibal where it's like, let me take some yeah. dead people's bones, right? Yeah. Like just a little yeah. seasoning, nothing bad. I mean, we've all done it. They're already dead. Exactly. I imagine him just like sneaking in some bones, grinding them up, like hoping he won't get caught, you know? But this guy yeah. literally like, yeah, let's have a human mukbang. Let's stream it together. I think that's how they found out he was streaming. <laughs> Aldrich makes a video about how he's been forced to leave the vegan community. (laughs) (laughs) So, Sophie. Yes. Now that we pretty much talked about Aldrich. We pretty much did. We pretty much did talk about Aldrich. I do have one question um, that you may or may not have the answer to before we move on. Okay. What made Aldrich try human flesh for the first time? I don't know. But let me ask you something else. Certainly. Did Rosaria try any flesh? Okay, so this is this is interesting because Rosaria is one of the more confusing parts of Dark Souls 3. It's actually like weird to compare her to Aldrich because it's like they both seem to be just made out of random bits and pieces, but I feel like it's mm-hmm. kind of it's coherent with Rosaria. If you refer back to Japanese mythology, she makes a little bit more sense. Just to recap why Rosaria is fucking weird, right? It's that she she sits in the Cathedral of the Deep, overseeing a bunch of grubs. Mm-hmm. But she's also in charge of a PvP covenant that specifically hunts the gods of Anolondo's servants. But she's also one of the gods of Anolondo. And possibly, like, Guinevere's daughter or niece or something. Here's this this holy godlike woman from one perspective. But mm-hmm. from another perspective, she she's is... She's a PvP streamer. She's a PvP streamer who lives in a pile of shit. <laughs> that's... Sophie, that's a shit bucket and show it some respect. You got a shit bucket. This seems totally random. It seems like they just got like, well, there has to be a PvP coven. Fucking give it to Rosaria. Uh, what's going to happen to this soul? Give it to Rosaria. Uh, who's going to be in the room? Fucking put Rosaria there. And it, it appears <laughs> to not make any sense if you look at it that way. There is a specific Japanese myth that it reminded me of. And I think this might be intentional. I think they might be kind of like calling back to this. So... There's a Japanese myth that is very, very close to, if people know the Greek myth of Persephone in the underworld. So the first man and the first woman are Izanagi and Izanami. And one of the stories about them is that Izanami dies in childbirth and she goes to the underworld. And then Izanagi decides to go to the underworld to rescue her to bring her back. So when Izanagi finally finds her in the underworld, it turns out that when she was down there, Izanami ate food from the underworld that was, like, corrupted. Mm -hmm. And consequently, like, she has started to become this, like, hive of corruption. Like, her body has started to rot. She's infested with maggots. Um, And when he sees her, he leaves her behind and he runs back out of hell, and he puts a boulder over it to stop her getting out. So you can see how that's quite similar to Persephone, like the way Hades kidnaps Persephone, and because she eats the pomegranates when she's in the underworld, she has to stay there half the time. So um, what Izanami then does is she's like, well, if you've left me behind, I swear vengeance on you, and I swear vengeance on everyone else. And I am declaring myself basically queen of the underworld and I'm coming to get you. So she becomes this malevolent figure and you can sort of see, okay, that kind of works as a model for Rosaria Mm -hmm. because Rosaria is like, here's this holy person who probably came directly from Anor Londo and she's brought to this cathedral and then something happens in the cathedral. It's not clear if like, Maybe she partook of the feasts. Maybe it was just the corruption got to her. It's not clear what actually corrupts her. But that gets into her, and then 
you can see that like her um, chambers, they are sealed shut. There are like these um, stakes in the wall that are sort of binding everything. Like they're desperate for her not to get out. And you can see, okay, she's kind of as an army then. She's like this pure thing. She went to this place. She did something. She's now become like this corrupt thing that nobody wants. So what does she do? She forms a PVP covenant. And she starts <laughs> sending her her followers after the followers of the gods as sort of revenge. So like she kind of makes sense if you think she's as an army. TLDR, she's a priestess who got corrupted by all the stuff happening at the Cathedral of the Deep. And then she did she wants revenge. Yeah. As you would. As you would. And also, Sophie, her tent's been removed, right? Yes. Why? I don't know. But you asked before, like, where did Aldrich get his taste for human flesh? Oh, no. Did he start with her tongue? I don't know. It just says that her firstborn bit her tongue off. Completely unclear who the firstborn is. I think they're ever mentioned again. But it could make sense. Like, maybe firstborn meaning yeah. the first person she cleansed. I don't Perhaps. know. But, like, it, it's, just, it's just interesting that, like... She has a firstborn. It's never specified who it is, but she is in the cathedral with the guy whose gimmick is that he eats people. So it's and possible. her firstborn bit her tongue. Yeah, yeah. I don't know who else it would be. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's either yeah. got to be Aldrich or literally anyone else. Oh, this is like oof. gross. Okay, now Sophie. Yes. I think we covered pretty much everything in the Cathedral of the Deep as relating to today's episode. Yeah. That was even longer than the Bastard's Curse. (laughs) Which was already too long. (laughs) I took some notes. And um, so the other part of this episode is we're going to talk about Gwendolyn. Because Gwendolyn is also the other part of Aldrich. You might say Gwendolyn's on the menu. So, um, I don't even know if we need to recap who Gwendolyn is because everybody knows and loves Gwendolyn. We did a whole episode on Gwendolyn um, that is about Gwendolyn's sort of like ambiguity. You can uh, watch that. We'll link it below if for some reason you don't know who Gwendolyn is. What's up with the whole Gwendolyn situation? Why is Aldrich eating Gwendolyn when we come to visit them in their castle? And there's so many other people he could be eating. Why Gwendolyn? Do you know why? Why? Because Gwendolyn is a snack. True, true. So there's two reasons Gwendolyn gets eaten. One of which is the straightforward one, and one of which is the more interesting one. And I, they don't cancel each other out, but there's sort of two reasons Gwendolyn's a target. Let's start with the straightforward one. So the straightforward one is that Aldrich wants to eat the gods. And uh, we have one god left, and it's Gwendolyn. Mm-hmm. Um, now, it's not 100% accurate to say that, like, there's literally one god left, and it's Gwendolyn. Uh, but Gwendolyn is the one that's, like, a direct descendant of Gwyn, and has some sort of, like, authority still. Yeah, Gwendolyn's left in charge, essentially. Everybody else, like, effed off. Yeah, because, like, you've got people like Yoshka and Filianor. Who are useless. Who are useless, but they're also direct descendants of Gwyn. But also, no one really seems to know who they are. But then you also have, like, Rosaria. Rosaria is some sort of descendant of Guinevere. Um, the Dancer is some sort of descendant of Guinevere. Then there's the whole Lothric bloodline, which was founded by the Nameless King. Mm-hmm. Um. Little Asterisk here, Nameless King is fucking dead. Like, a lot of people think Nameless King is hollow. No, he's dead. Only humans hollow, gods don't hollow. Nameless King, when you meet him, he looks like that because he died and he's been brought back by the bell. Bro is dead, probably not worth eating. (laughs) Aldrich, like, I don't want to get food poisoning. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Not crazy. Also, it's probably like licking a battery. Like, that sort of weird, like electrical taste because you'd be have all the lightning how many batteries did you leak sophie enough you don't know if they still got charge (laughs) 
We didn't always have USB chargers, kids. That was the first time Aldrich ate a human. He was like, oh, human. Is he still alive? <laughs> Let me lick him. <laughs> lick him. <laughs> so I think that, like, they're all on the menu. Mm-hmm. Um, Lothric Castle specifically is kind of paranoid about the deep and like the Lothric family are probably going to be nommed at some point, but like, I think the idea is Gwendolyn is like the purest. It's like directly from Gwen to Gwendolyn. So Gwendolyn's like the main course. And then there's the sort of political reason why it's Gwendolyn. Mm -hmm. This is the important part. I was like, like a lot of people, um, Came away from Dark Souls 3 feeling like they kind of did Gwendolyn dirty. Yes. That, like, Gwendolyn, who, like, was compl- was sort of, like, anonymous and suffered and was holding everything together while their family were off doing other things and they weren't ever recognized for it. And then it's, like, after all that, they finally show up on screen again and they're dead. Yeah. Um, was kind of, like, disappointing. And I still think that's not great, but... I think the circumstances of the death and what led up to the death can be read in a kind of redemptive-ish way. Gwendolyn, prior to Pontiff Sullivan showing up in Irithel with the giant amoeba, (laughs) Mm -hmm. is in charge of Irithel. Like, Gwendolyn is actually ruling Irithel of the Boreal Valley and ruling Anor Londo. What Sullivan does by locking Gwendolyn away is Sullivan fashions this story that, like, oh, yes, uh, the great god Gwendolyn, they're not feeling very well right now. They're a little sick. They're a little under the weather. So um, I'm just going to be speaking on their behalf for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what Sullivan's doing is, like, it's one of the few times that, like, we talked about the way that the Souls games use sort of terminology that's, means one thing to us and might mean something else to them. But calling Sullivan the pontiff is kind of appropriate because Sullivan is setting himself up as I am the representative of God. He's just saying I'm the representative of Gwendolyn. And that is the source of Sullivan's power. The power is not emanating from Sullivan himself, despite the fact Sullivan is the coolest villain ever. (laughs) <laughs> He's got a magic sword and a fire sword, and he invented frost magic, and he came from another dimension, and he has a fire that never goes out that you think would be really significant, but it's not. <laughs> All those cool, cool things that Sullivan has. That's not actually the source of Sullivan's power. The source of Sullivan's power is actually Gwendolyn. He's just saying, I have the power of Gwendolyn. It's coming through me. I speak for Gwendolyn. And looked at that way, that's really, really significant in Gwendolyn's story, because Gwendolyn is not acknowledged in Dark Souls. Gwendolyn spends the entire of Dark Souls hiding from everyone. Like, their title is, like, The Dark Sun, which, like, the way it's it's written is, like, it's not a sun that is dark, it's a sun that is in the dark. It's like, it's like they are, yeah, they're the one that is keeping Anor Londo running. No one knows they're there, and it's kind of like fascinating how, like, the nameless king, the guy who actually betrayed the royal family, sided with the enemy in the middle of a war. Like, that character, like, yeah, the statues get taken down or destroyed, but they're still acknowledged. People still know who they are. Like, there's that triptych of statues that you see in the boss room, where it's like Gwyn is in the middle and Guinevere is on one side, and then there is a, a, a blank... Like a length. hollow space. There's yeah. a hollow space. So it's like, okay, Nameless King statue was there. Yeah, like, the guy we're not supposed to talk about, everybody knows, we removed him from history. Yeah, he was there. They didn't even go, hey, we're promoting Gwendolyn, let's put their statues where the Nameless King statues were. No. No, no. There is no acknowledgement that Gwendolyn even exists. And it's like, we talk about this in the Gwendolyn episode, but like, 
Gwyn's whole deal with fire and the sun and everything is like, oh, everything was like formless and I am the god that enforced binary opposition upon the world. So everything is now because of me, it's one thing or the other and that's where my power is coming from. And Gwendolyn's whole deal is Gwendolyn is not one thing or the other. The thing about, like, the constant arguments over, like, is Gwendolyn trans, is Gwendolyn male, is Gwendolyn female, is Gwendolyn gender fluid, I don't think it actually matters as much as the fact you have to ask the question in the first place. Like, the fact that Gwendolyn is so ambiguous and it's so unclear is the point. Because, like, people will say, well, it says in this item description, blah, 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 so therefore that, but, like, yeah, but it says that, and then it will also say something that contradicts it. And, like, pieces of, like, the character's portrayal will contradict things. Like, everything about Gwendolyn contradicts everything else about Gwendolyn, and that is why that character is so interesting. That's why Gwendolyn only has a first name, like Cher. <laughs> Or Madonna. Or brief, briefly, um, when Jerry Halliwell just tried going by Jerry, and it's like, no. Because she's no Gwendolyn. You're not on that level. Not on that level. You can see why if your dad is obsessed with everything being very binary and very ordered, yeah. that Gwendolyn's not, not the one he's promoting. And the thing is, like, it's not as if Gwyn thinks that Gwendolyn doesn't fit in and just kicks Gwendolyn out or something like that. Gwendolyn has to stay there and effectively run the city without yeah. anyone knowing that they're there. So it's like the entire thing is resting on the back of like the kid that nobody wants and they're not acknowledged for it. Not only are they not acknowledged, it's like Gwendolyn was the only one left and instead of being able to speak up, it's like, no, we're going to have a picture of your sister right there on the wall. You're going to be behind it and pretend you're talking for it. Guinevere leaves. There's one god left in an Orlando, and the only way that they can communicate with people is to, to pretend, pretend to, be Guinevere. to be Guinevere. What's significant about Dark Souls 3 is, like, clearly in between then and now, Gwendolyn has actually openly been in charge of an Orlando. And not even, like, the sun version of Anor Londo, like, the dark twilight Anor Londo. That's what Irithyll is. So, in case people don't know or need the memory jogged or something, when you first arrive in Anor Londo in Dark Souls, it's this beautiful, sunny place. But the more you explore, the more you discover that that's not actually real. That's an illusion. The illusion's created and maintained by Gwendolyn. And the real version of Anor Londo is this, like, dark, empty twilight place. And you can see that, like, that over time becomes Irithyll. It becomes this place with, like, the moon in the sky and, like, it's cold and there's snow and everything is the opposite of what it used to be. All of the things that, like, were in Gwendolyn's way in Dark Souls 1, like the illusion of Guinevere, the illusory sun, the fact that they're not acknowledged, there's no representations of them, no one knows who they are, that all at some point went away and it was just openly like Gwendolyn's running an Orlando now out in public as Gwendolyn. There's no illusions. There's no pretense that it's still the city of the sun. It's just the cold, dark twilight place and Gwendolyn's in charge. That is the complete opposite of everything that happened in Dark Souls 1. And the fact that that happened is why Gwendolyn becomes a target for Sullivan. Sullivan doesn't try creating an illusory Guinevere or something. He just goes after Gwendolyn because everyone knows who Gwendolyn is. So, Sophie, this just gave me a vision. Mm -hmm. So once Gwendolyn was out there, uh, they became a target. Mm. So actually, Gwendolyn was Gwen's favorite. Yeah. And that's why Gwen was like, I must protect my favorite child at all cost. Keep them away from mm -hmm. danger. Make sure yeah. nobody ever harms them. Yeah. Why, why didn't you put them in the ring city then? Like the other one no he was just like getting rid of the other one like here's your egg go in the ringed city bye this is the thing because like there's this whole um there's the whole like relationship between Gwendolyn Guinevere and the nameless king and Gwen that's like oh that's like an interesting dynamic and then Dark Souls is like oh by the way there's two other kids we just didn't know about <laughs> them till now that brings us to Yoshka. so like you're asking why hasn't Yoshka been killed she's completely effing useless 
No, but it's like, I think it's pretty clear from looking at that, that Yoshka's the backup plan because she would be next in line after Gwendolyn. So the reason that like, I sort of want to talk about Aldrich and Gwendolyn together is that like, in a sense, they're both manifestations of like that binary world breaking down. And I think that's, that's kind of why Gwendolyn ends up being so public and being in charge. It's like that world that you were putting everything on the line to protect when you were like hunting the enemies of the gods, maintaining the illusion, keeping everything running while your father and your sister had pissed off and left you by yourself. All of that stuff, like Gwendolyn was sacrificing everything to protect, it ultimately started to go away. And it's like, oh, but as it starts to go away, the world becomes a little less binary, a little less constraining for you. And suddenly Gwendolyn finds themselves in this world where all the things that were keeping them locked up literally in the fucking basement Mm -hmm. um, no longer apply. And it's like, you don't really get a sense of how Gwendolyn felt toward the end. It's it's really interesting that, like, everything Gwendolyn is struggling to protect, as it starts to fade away, that's actually what is making Gwendolyn more powerful and more significant. And I also think it's really interesting, like, you do get one, one glimpse into Gwendolyn's mind as they're being devoured. Yeah. That's really sad. The thing that they were thinking of as they died was Yoshka. Yeah. Like, that in itself is like, oh, Gwendolyn's actually, like, Gwendolyn's in charge and, like, their thoughts are of somebody else. They're not thinking about, like, maintaining the Age of Fire anymore. It's like, it's like Gwendolyn actually comes into their own as, like, a ruler and a character, but it all happens off screen and then they die, like, before you meet them. Yeah. And it's like it takes it takes the Aldrich situation to do that, where like the world is falling to pieces and there's these questions over like how long can this sustain itself? It's like this bittersweet thing where it's like you finally you finally got recognition after everything that you cared about went away. It's like you were able to build something new, but then you were almost too good at it and that made you a target. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe if, you know, Gwendolyn was not devoured and backstabbed, they could have brought forth something yeah, new, Yeah, because Gw- Gwendolyn good. is actually like, this is another thing that we talked about in that episode, Gwendolyn is kind of the herald of the new age, because Gwendolyn's also described as being like the youngest. So it's like Gwyn Gwyn has like, we'll leave Dark Souls 3 aside for a second. Because Gwyn has three kids. Philinor and Yoshka confuse everything. But it's like, oh, isn't it again really notable that like Gwyn, who is this like arch sort of patriarch figure, like the big muscly old guy with the big beard. um, His two kids are like, one is like hyper masculine and one is hyper feminine. So there's like hyper masculine war god big phallic spear, like, stabbing people, warrior cult. And then it's like, and also he's like the princess of sunlight who is all about healing and she's reclining on a pillow and she's got giant boobs and she's all about fertility and all this other stuff. And it's like, okay, so that's like, that's so, like, basic. It's it's so unimaginative, the most basic, like, mythic archetype thing. But then it's like, and then there's this third kid who completely fucks all of that up. And it is completely unclear what the fuck they are or what they're supposed to be doing or where they fit into any of this. <sighs> and, like, they're born, like, later, presumably, like, as everything is starting to sort of fade away and kind of become grey and indistinct and, like, you know, people are born and they're not quite alive but they're not quite dead and, like, the sun is sort of there but sort of not and everything is in twilight and fog. And it's like, oh, Gwendolyn's actually, like, the perfect god for that age. Gwendolyn is actually the perfect god for the world as the Age of Fire is fading. And they actually become that. Mm -hmm. Like, they actually grow into that. They become, like, the ruler of this, like, world where everything is starting to fracture and change. And they're, they're, like, the one thing that can adapt to it. 
they're not reliant on there being these hard boundaries. So Gwendolyn is the new age. But that's the thing. Gwendolyn's the new age, but then we, we never actually see that new age because they get eaten off screen by Aldridge. Aldridge's thing is also not being tied down to like hard binary things. Because Aldrich's whole thing is like their protein, their form can change. They also oppose linking the fire. Like their thoughts upon the fire is like, well, what if, what if something else happened instead? It's not even clear what they are. Cause like we, you, every time you see anything of them, they're completely different. So it's actually like in the same way that Gwendolyn is like the perfect sort of like ruler for this time. Aldrich is sort of the perfect villain for that time. Neither of them are tied down to, like, fire or dark or set forms or set anything. It's like those two things end up in conflict. And that, to me, is, like, a way more interesting story than what if a cool guy with wings and two swords was at war with two princes, but they never actually shared any screen time together. Sophie, do the outro. That was The Snack Covenant, episode F10, which is uh, also the function that makes your keyboard brighter using a laptop. And uh, it was about Aldrich and Gwendolyn. It was also, from my perspective, about uh, one hour, 40 minutes long. So subtract the current time of the episode from that, and that's how much Sin cut out, and I hope it was over half. (laughs) Well, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sin. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And see you all next time. Sin, before we go. Yes. I don't know. It's being annoying. Oh. Well, before we go, we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do more MD Geist. We're gonna do Reborn and all the good stuff. Not tonight. Yes. Surprise, Sophie. Do 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 do.